2,000 years ago, in a remote part of the Roman Empire, someone was born who would change the history of the world, Jesus. He was seen from the very beginning as this extremely radical, revolutionary figure that was going to bring more change than they had seen since the time of the prophets. After a life of wandering through the hills and villages of Galilee and Judea, preaching and healing, Jesus was betrayed, arrested, and brutally put to death. Jesus' death on the cross was hugely difficult for the early Christians. It was extremely embarrassing to say that they were followers of a leader who had been crucified. But in the years after his crucifixion, Jesus' story was written down by his followers to explain his extraordinary life and death. These four Gospels would later form a major part of the Christian Bible and enable his message to be spread all over the world. It's just extraordinary to come here now and see these crowds who come from all over the world still being drawn by the power of that moment that would change everything. This is very exciting to find. We have people who are still so skeptical that they claim there's no Nazareth in the first century. But for hundreds of years, scholars have been trying to look behind the Jesus of the Gospels, the divine Christ of faith, to uncover the historical figure, a Mediterranean Jew who lived and died as a man, and according to his followers, was resurrected from the dead. This is absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, they knew what we call the laws of nature just as much as we do. They knew that dead people stay dead. In this series, using the very latest archaeological, historical, and theological research, nine of the world's leading biblical experts will re-examine the gospel accounts of Jesus' life to uncover the true meaning behind the 2,000-year-old story of Jesus. This is a story too improbable not to be true, because it's not what you'd make up if you're starting a new world religion. Right in the heart of one of Britain's largest cities is a library that contains the oldest known piece of the Christian New Testament anywhere in the world. When you study the New Testament, you've got dozens and in fact hundreds of manuscripts from the first uh, three or four or five centuries, uh, including some of these tiny fragments that go really back very close within um, 60 or so years of when the documents were originally written and no other texts from the ancient world have any documentation remotely like that. So we're on much more solid ground with the New Testament than any other book from antiquity. This fragment of papyrus is believed to have been written within just a hundred years of Jesus' death. It contains a few lines describing Jesus' encounter with the Roman governor in Jerusalem as he is condemned to death on a cross. The manuscript itself happens to be part of the 18th chapter of John's Gospel. And where we see Jesus talking to Pontius Pilate, this is the representative of the kingdom of God confronting the representative of the kingdom of the world. And what are they going to talk about? Well, what do you think? Kingdom, power, and truth. Um, he says to Jesus, so uh, are you some kind of a king? And Jesus says, well, you call me a king. He says, but this is why I was born and this is what I came into the world for, that I might bear witness to the truth. And then Pilate says his famous answer, what is truth? Ever since that question first appeared in the Christian Bible, Scholars have searched for an answer to help them understand the story of Jesus contained in the Gospels. The Christian Bible, as we know it today, is made up of the 39 books of the Old Testament, Hebrew scriptures written between two and 3,000 years ago, and the 27 books of the New Testament. At its heart, are the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the narrative stories of the life of Jesus, first written down in the century after Jesus' death. 
I think what we can say is not necessarily we've got these early manuscripts, therefore it must all be true, but we've got these early manuscripts which point back like a set of signposts from different roads all leading to the same city. And because the manuscripts are slightly different here and there, we can see that these traditions have diverged, but they've diverged from a common source, and we can go back very close to that common source and say again and again, this is actually what John or Paul or whoever wrote. It's wonderfully sharp, hard evidence of that by comparison with all the other texts that we know from the ancient world. Most biblical scholars today agree that the best way to understand the Gospels, and particularly what they say about Jesus, is to try and understand the life and times in which they were composed, the outlook of the people for whom they were first written, and the world in which those stories took place. In this series, we want to uncover the original meaning of the story of Jesus, to investigate the gospel accounts of his life, not through the eyes of a 21st century reader, but through those of the people for whom those stories were first written almost 2,000 years ago. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. The Jewish first century world into which Jesus was born and when the accounts of his life were first compiled was far more religious than today and full of expectation as to a coming Messiah, someone who would liberate the people from all their troubles. The stories about Jesus' birth were full of suggestions that he was that saviour. There's a lot of dispute over the historicity of the infancy stories, how much one can say there's historical truth in them and how much not. Some people are more optimistic and some people are more sceptical. And a lot of it comes down to people's presuppositions about whether miraculous things can happen. Dr Simon Gathercole is a senior lecturer at the University of Cambridge and an expert in the study of the New Testament. He believes the writers of the Gospels wanted to tell their readers who they believed Jesus really was, and that right from the start of his life, he was destined to change the course of history. And the message of the Gospels, of course, is that, that this particular uh, Jesus Christ uh, is the Son of God who went on to, to die and rise again uh, and bring salvation to the world. So uh, this isn't mere history. Uh, it's not less than history, but it is history with a message. At the time the Gospels were first compiled in the first century, what we would call modern Israel and Palestine was a part of the Roman Empire. This meant that for Jews, their holy land was under pagan rule. And in Caesar's empire, the emperors were thought of as gods who could do no wrong. For the gospel writers, the extraordinary story of Jesus' birth, life and death was a direct challenge to that world. For them, Jesus was the true God, not Caesar. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke were probably both written in the sort of 70s, 80s uh, AD perhaps. And those times were significant because uh, emperors at that time in the Roman Empire had just started being called sons of God. Uh, and so when we read in Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, both the infancy narratives uh, call Jesus the Son of God. Those with their sort of sensitive political antennae up would perhaps be struck by the fact that Jesus is the true Son of God uh, and so perhaps a challenger to the emperor. Modern skeptics often point to the differences in the four gospel accounts of Jesus' life as evidence of their falsehood. Many biblical scholars see these differences as simply alternative points of focus, a way of telling the same core story but from a different point of view. 
Our traditional infancy narrative is actually a conflation of the two separate accounts in Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, and they contain some similar incidents and some, some different incidents. So in Matthew's Gospel, uh, Joseph is perhaps the leading figure. Uh, it's Joseph who receives the message from the angel. On the other hand, when we come to Luke's Gospel, uh, Joseph is scarcely mentioned at all. The attention is all on Mary uh, and on Mary's family. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Jesus' family history was very important to his followers. Both Gospel writers provide us with a detailed genealogy dating back hundreds of years. But rather than being a literal guide to Jesus' ancestors, they contain a message as to who they believed Jesus really was, the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. First of all, amongst several peoples, Genealogies per se are important. It's part of your past. You should know where you come from as well as where you are headed to. The whole idea that the son of a simple carpenter from Nazareth, but if you say he's a descendant of David, then it's different because there had been that tradition that the Messiah would be a descendant of the royal house of David. So the genealogy there is very, very pertinent. David is the crucial kingly figure in the Old Testament, the model of an ideal king, the first divinely approved king of Israel. And so he becomes the template that the New Testament authors draw on when they want to describe Jesus as an ideal king. Uh, Jesus is the second David, if you like, the son of David. Matthew's Gospel is arranged uh, in three blocks of 14 uh, ancestors. And this number 14 is probably significant because numerically it can refer to the name David. Uh, the Hebrew letters Dalet, Vav, Dalet, uh, four plus six plus four makes 14. And so Matthew's genealogy uh, shouts to us that Jesus is David, 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 the son of, the son of David. Uh, Luke's Gospel is rather different in having a genealogy which goes back not to David, but actually to Adam. Uh, and so Luke is perhaps using his genealogy to present the fact that Jesus uh, is not uh, a narrowly Jewish Messiah. He is a Jewish Messiah, but he's not one who is only for Israel, but he's someone who has come for all the descendants of Adam. Uh, so Luke uh, has a more universal outlook in his genealogy. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. The miraculous conception in Matthew's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel is vital to the drama. First, that it is an action that comes about purely by divine intervention. It doesn't come about through the natural human means. And so salvation is said to be entirely of God. On the other hand, though, it is a real conception. And so he is a real human being. And so we see the two sides of Jesus' identity, that he is truly man, but also divine, as the uh, line in Matthew's Gospel puts it that he's Emmanuel, which in Hebrew means God with us. He's truly God, but he's also truly with us. When the early Christians read these infancy narratives in Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, they probably took them literally and probably assumed that these things uh, did really happen to Jesus. But they certainly wouldn't stop there. They wouldn't think of that as the uh, primary point. They would think of these accounts as uh, telling them uh, how Jesus was God's son. So we see the fulfillment of prophecy uh, all the way through these infancy narratives, uh, genealogies as well. Uh, and these things tell us, uh, tell, told the early Christians, that Jesus didn't just come out of a clear blue sky, but he was uh, planned by God to have come at this particular time. 
And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Geography is important here because Bethlehem is a crucial town in the Old Testament. It's a small town and politically and economically insignificant, but it's famous by association with David. Uh, David's father, Jesse, was called Jesse of Bethlehem, and so David may have been born there. He certainly came uh, from there, lived his early life there. Uh, and crucially as well, he was also anointed as king there. Then we have, developing out of that, a prophecy that a ruler will come out of Bethlehem who will shepherd Israel. And this is the prophecy that Matthew picks up on, the prophecy of Micah, which Jesus is then said to fulfill. Over the centuries, Historians and scientists have debated the star of Bethlehem and have tried to come up with a rational explanation. A comet, or a planet, or even a previously unknown supernova. But none has proved totally convincing. Many scholars now believe the star is more of a symbolic device, a biblical metaphor that would have had particular meaning to first century Jews. The star which leads the uh, Magi, the three wise men so-called, to Jesus uh, is significant as an indicator, another indicator of Jesus' supernatural identity, Jesus' heavenly uh, nature. And it alludes, I think, most particularly to a prophecy in the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, uh, where we're told that a star will come out of Jacob. The prophecy of Bilam in the book of Numbers, Darach Kochav Miyakov, a star has arisen from heaven. But as the Messiah, the anointed king, of course the anointed king is a kind of a star, or the son of a star. All these metaphors are uh, very pertinent metaphors and it's very natural that they were being used. This star also uh, connects up with something in Luke's gospel, uh, where we're told in quite similar terms that Jesus is like a light. He's the day spring, the day star that comes from on high. And this again is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, this time from the book of Isaiah, in which uh, the light from on high will come and shine on those in darkness. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. The incident with the so-called three wise men is a fascinating one, uh, and it's one which has been particularly embroidered and, and romanticized in later Christian history. So we don't even know from Matthew's Gospel whether there were three of them. They certainly weren't three kings. They're not described particularly as wise men. Uh, they're described as magoi, and magoi uh, in Greek are really astronomers or astrologers, uh, people who use the stars for uh, perhaps magical purposes. The shepherds also appear on the scene in Luke's Gospel, and in some ways the point of the shepherds is that the message of Jesus is not just for the elites and the priests and the, the nobles, uh, but also for just very ordinary shepherds. According to one of the Gospels, as soon as he was born, Jesus was in danger. Not only was he portrayed as a potential challenger to the Roman Emperor, but closer to home, he was also depicted as a rival to the King of the Jews, Herod. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Of all the characters in the birth stories, King Herod is one of the few for whom we have alternative contemporary historical sources. We know that he existed at the time of Jesus' birth, that he was the king of Judea, a client kingdom within the Roman Empire. Today, the ruins of his winter palace, Herodian, still overlook the town of Bethlehem. In the last decade of his life, Herod was an old man. So there were a lot of people around waiting for him to die. So that last decade of his life is filled according to Josephus, with lots of suspicion on both sides and lots of conspiracies, real or imagined. 
and accordingly lots of people getting killed by the old king who's afraid mm. of conspiracies around him. In that context, you have to understand the gospel story, which talks about Herod being afraid of yet another competitor coming along yeah. uh, uh, for the crown of the Jewish kingdom. According to the gospel stories, Herod was so incensed by Jesus as a possible rival to his throne that he ordered his troops to massacre all the male babies in Bethlehem. I think the story as you have it is probably something with no claim to, to historical truth as having happened, uh, but rather reflecting a antipathy to Herod, which in this case takes the form of, well, let's compare him to Pharaoh. Just as uh, Pharaoh presided over the persecution of Jewish boys at the time when a redeemer of the Jews was born, according to the book of Exodus, namely Moses, so too if a new Moses is going to come along, he better have his Pharaoh who tries to kill him as well. So it became very convenient to focus on Herod as Jesus' opposite number. Mm -hmm. And if one is very, very good, then the other one has to be very, very bad. That's the way these things work. Egypt is, of course, uh, in New Testament times, the old enemy of the nation of Israel. Uh, Israel had been captive in Egypt for hundreds of years. They'd been slaves there, they'd been oppressed there. So for Joseph to take Mary and Jesus there uh, means that things had got really desperate uh, in the land of Israel under the murderous rule of King Herod. But it's also a response to prophecy, uh, because in the book of Hosea, there's a prophecy which is picked up by Matthew's Gospel uh, about uh, God's Son coming out of Egypt. So again, Jesus is depicted as, uh, in this case unwittingly, fulfilling prophecy. I think the purpose of the Gospels is to tell the readers and the believers about the life and death and resurrection of a redeeming figure. And one of the things that you're entitled to expect in ancient stories about such heroes is something miraculous about their birth. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a miraculous um, salvation from a very great threat, as you have in Matthew, or whether it's being born as the result of an extraordinary prophecy, as you have in Luke, one way or the other, uh, uh, the point of the infancy stories is to ensure that from the very first moment, this redeeming figure has been underwritten by God. After Jesus' birth, the Gospels are almost completely silent about what happened next. We're told that his family returned to Nazareth, but there is only one story about his childhood in Galilee. It has led to a lot of wild speculation as to what Jesus was doing during those years, how he might have traveled all over the Middle East and Egypt and even as far as India and Tibet to study with Eastern mystics. There is one area of biblical research that can take our knowledge of the past beyond the written sources and help to explain Jesus' lost years and the world in which he grew up. I think there's a gap in the terms of the narration about Jesus' life, really because it didn't serve the interests of the gospel writers. They're trying to write something else, so they're, they don't mind putting in miraculous birth, at least two of them. And Luke doesn't mind putting in this story about Jesus being around 12 to show he's precocious. Um, John starts off with creation. <laughs> so then, then they're trying to get us to the ministry, apparently. So they, they, they just simply jump ahead to the ministry. So uh, we are left to surmise that he grew up more or less like everyone else in Galilee. Now what archaeology does for us is show us what that might look like. Professor James Strange is one of the world's leading biblical archaeologists. For the last 30 years, he has been excavating one of Galilee's most important first century cities, Sepphoris. Professor Strange believes that because Jesus' home village of Nazareth was just two hours' walk away, he could very possibly have visited and worked here. Well, here we are on the main road of Sepphoris, and people would be streaming in from behind me towards Tiberias. They would have been coming from Nazareth, from ancient Garus, from other places. They're coming here to uh, buy, to sell, to look for a physician, whatever it is they need. They come in uh, 
sometimes because they're curious, but sometimes they're looking for work. So this, this is going to be an ideal place to do exactly that. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Hidden away in the Gospels, in a description of Jesus as he begins his ministry in Galilee, is a single verse that provides a few clues as to Jesus' early life. Traditionally, Jesus has been described as a carpenter, but a more accurate translation of the original Greek word tekton would be a general builder. Jesus and his father, and presumably his brothers then, as a technon, tekton, means uh, a family that is uh, understood to be working with their hands and they have all the skills and knowledge they have to have to work with wood and to work with stone. So uh, this, uh, this is fundamental to, the, uh, to, the, to living here. That makes Jesus and his family uh, ideal for a, such a place as this when it's undergoing construction for the first time. During Jesus' childhood, Sepphoris was undergoing a major building boom under the local king, Herod Antipas. For Jesus and his brothers, this would have been an ideal place to have looked for work. Well, five, six kilometers away is ancient Nazareth itself, where Jesus lives with his father and his brothers and his sisters, his mother. So it's not at all out of reason that he would be here with his father as the, as the eldest, uh, looking for work. So uh, I think of this as an ideal place to contextualize Jesus as a, as a jobbing builder who builds projects for anything from houses or as small as an ox yoke all the way up to working on frameworks and doing uh, stone cutting for large buildings. Uh, we can see the first century cut stones reflected everywhere we look. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? The Gospel accounts appear to suggest that Jesus had an extended blood family. In fact, in the first century Jewish world in which he lived, not having any brothers or sisters would have been very unusual. But over the centuries, the idea of Jesus having a close family has posed a problem for some Christian denominations. We understand from Scripture that Jesus came from an extended family. It was not simply Joseph, Mary, and Jesus living in the household, but there were siblings, at least four more brothers whose names we know, and at, at least two more sisters, and maybe more. Unfortunately, we don't know their names. According to Roman Catholics and Orthodox Christians, Jesus' mother, Mary, was a perpetual virgin, and that after giving birth to him, she had no further children. So they believe his brothers and sisters are not blood relations of Jesus. The traditional explanation for the brothers of Jesus, for example, in the Greek Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church, has been that Joseph was a widower, and he had children from his first marriage, who became the stepbrothers of Jesus, and uh, that would put Jesus as the only child of Mary. In the Protestant tradition, they see these children as being the biological children of Joseph and Mary, born after Jesus. So in whatever way you would want to explain it, though, we understand that Jesus doesn't grow up as an only child. When Jesus was growing up, Nazareth was just a small village of less than 500 people. But today, it is a huge city in modern Israel. No remains of the ancient village had ever been found until two years ago, when an extraordinary find was uncovered near the center of the city. Well, around 2009, some builders were trying to build something here, and when they drove the foundation down, they discovered something they thought would be of interest to archaeologists. So that's exactly what they did. They called in the archaeologists so that they could check this. When they went down far enough, they found they were in a first century house. This is a very exciting find. We have people who are still so skeptical 
that they claim there's no Nazareth in the first century. So it's, it's wonderful confirmation that we were not mistaken. There really is a first century Nazareth. According to the archeologists, it was a very simple building. Single story, made of mud and stone with two rooms and a courtyard. They also found clay and chalk vessels that were known to be used by Galilean Jews at that time, an indication that the house was lived in by a devout Jewish family. By looking at the Gospel of Luke, for example, we can see that Jesus was born into a Jewish family that was religiously observant. They were pious people, they prayed. They went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem and it was their custom. They circumcised him on the eighth day. They announced his name. They paid the redemption price of a newborn son. And so the picture we get of Jesus' family is a family that is deeply embedded in its Jewish identity and its Jewish tradition. Well, religion in the first century is not a separate category. It suffuses your life. You know, the, the modern idea of religion as being some aspect of your life is very, very modern or postmodern for some. So in the first century, it just, it's just sort of a given. You know there's God in the universe and God has made all that there is. We all know that the age of 12 or 13 is the age of a bar mitzvah today in Jewish practice, and that this is a transition period in a boy's life. The Gospels contain only one story about Jesus' childhood, but it's a very significant one, as it reveals the full extent of Jesus' religious upbringing. The Gospel of Luke tells us that at the age of 12, Jesus accompanied his parents to Jerusalem for the Jewish holy festival of the Passover. And so as Jesus comes up to the temple in Jerusalem when he's 12, uh, he stays behind. And Mary and Joseph return with a large group of travelers. They're traveling in a group because it's not safe to just walk that long distance on your own. And they don't even notice that he's missing until dinner time. They thought he was with the kids, but he wasn't. So they have to hightail it back to Jerusalem. It takes them another full day to get there. And then they have to search a city that has no maps and try to find a kid who's been left behind. I think they must have been just panicked. Where do they find him? They find him at the temple. And he's talking to the religious teachers, to the Pharisees, to the scribes, to the people who know scripture and who know Jewish practice. And they are impressed with this boy. I think sometimes people don't realize that Jewish society at the time of Jesus was a very literate society. That meant people were taught to read. They might not write so much, but they were certainly able to read, and they learned to read by reading the scriptures. And this was very important because the Sabbath service in the synagogue was conducted by the common people, by the lay people, not by the priests. And anyone who could read could be invited to participate in the Torah reading or the prophets reading or the books of Moses reading in a synagogue service. Synagogue means two things. On the one hand, it just means 10 men gathered to declaim Torah, to do something formal with the Bible. And, but secondly, it means a place where this is done. Archeologically now, we have seven structures that are identified as good candidates as synagogues. There might have been one in Nazareth. If the, if the villagers got to a size they felt like they really needed one, it'd be perfectly reasonable for them to build one. His classroom was the streets of a Jewish town, and he watched shepherds with their sheeps and goats. He watched farmers in the field as they spread grain. He watched fathers with their children. And he thought about these things that he observed. They became the images that he would later use in his parables, so that when he launched his public ministry and he spoke to everyday people on the street, tax collectors, sinners, women, he could speak to them about God in language that they understood. Well, the lost years of Jesus from 12 to 30, I think he's a full-fledged member of his family and of his village. We would expect him to then, as a firstborn son, to be married, 
but he's not. <laughs> we would also expect him to, uh, if, if something has happened to Joseph, for example, uh, since Joseph disappears in the narrative, if he was killed or in an accident or just died of an infection, then it falls upon Jesus, stay home, take care of his mother. He didn't do that. We would not expect him to have detailed knowledge of Jewish traditions, temple traditions, and uh, scriptures themselves. But he apparently does. And so we're confounded in e each time we make this uh, prediction about Jesus. We're very good about predicting what we would find if we dig in an environment like Sepphoris. We're much less, <laughs> we're less successful in predicting what Jesus would turn out to be. Most biblical scholars consider Mark to be the earliest gospel, probably written about 40 years after Jesus' death. And it begins not with the story of Jesus' birth or his early life, but with the account of one of the most enigmatic and misunderstood people in the New Testament, a person who had a profound influence on both Jesus and Christianity, John the Baptist. Dr. Joan Taylor is an expert on John the Baptist and believes the later church downplayed his real significance in Jesus' life story. The whole story of Jesus, the whole story of the kingdom of God, the beginning of Christianity, begins at this point here at the Jordan River. It's just extraordinary to come here now and see these crowds, these tourists, um, who've come from all over the world, still being drawn by the power of that moment, that moment when Jesus came to John the Baptist and something happened that would change everything. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, Immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Archaeologist Dr. Shimon Gibson has spent a lifetime investigating the many biblical locations connected with John the Baptist. He is convinced he has now identified a new site never before filmed. John was also baptizing at Enon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized. We're on top of uh, Tel Shalem which is identified as Salem. And you can look all the way around you. That's towards the north, towards Bet She'an. We have uh, the Transjordanian mountains over there. And then at the foot of this tell, we have a very large uh, spring complex. And it's one of 13 or so sort of springs in the vicinity. And this one is identified as Anon. Look, I've even, even got a map here. Let me just show you. Uh, here you can see where standing here right and look at all these blue spots they all represent well, sources of the water blue spots they're absolutely yes. everywhere all yeah. around us the site is part of an old israeli army fort that dates back to the late 1960s when israel was still at war with its neighbor jordan no excavations have uh, taken place here. It's a site that hardly anybody comes to, and indeed, probably, this is the first time that uh, it's being filmed. And what was uh, surprising for me, on the slope over there, uh, I came across pottery, which dates from that period. Here you've got some uh, rubble. Maybe this is the edge of the pool. You can see sort of uh, scatters of uh, potsherds uh, here and there, and... Uh, well, I mean, look, on the ground here, you can see various uh, potsherds here. That looks like it's from the Byzantine period. Oh, oh, that's good. This is actually from the Roman period. Wow. It's uh, first century, from the time of John the Baptist. So here you've got evidence that there's something here uh, at the Pool of Anon from the time of John the Baptist. 
According to the Gospels, John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, which for first century Jews was a revolutionary concept. Jews did immerse in water, but for reasons of ritual purity. For John, baptism meant something very different. It's interesting to notice that it's not only about the ritual value of purity, but also, at least in the case of John the Baptist, about atonement. Mm -hmm. If you want to be atoned, if you want to uh, be answered by, by God's acceptance, I would say, um, you have first to clean your heart, mm -hmm. to bring you into a new, um, a new status in front of God, I would so say. So that's why in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew, he challenges people who come to him. And he says, you brood of vipers yeah. who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. It's a very kind of provocative statement. And the Jordan River is um, a great river for that. The River Jordan had a huge symbolic importance for first century Jews. According to the Old Testament, it was here where their ancestors, led by Joshua, had first crossed into the Promised Land. And, and you know, all those parallels work very well. Mm -hmm. uh, you imagine oneself enter into the land, you imagine oneself enters into new identity. It's clear from all the other contemporary historical sources that John was an important religious figure in Galilee and Judea in the first century, so much so that he became a threat to the local king, Herod Antipas. Remember that there are thousands of followers. I mean, he was really a force to contend with. He was the guy that Herod Antipas uh, um, uh, hated and feared. Right. And it's the expansion of his strength, roughly about 28 uh, CE, that really puts the, the, the fear into Herod Antipas. And that's it, he's got to get rid of him. The Gospels also contain the story of John's death, how he was thrown into prison by Herod Antipas after he had spoken out about Herod's marriage to his brother's former wife, and how, in order to placate his wife, Herod had John beheaded. For Joan Taylor, John is an absolutely crucial figure in the story of Jesus the man who started him on his mission to change the world. Jesus experienced something absolutely profound here at the Jordan River, and he also felt that this was a momentous beginning himself. It's a visionary experience, and it's inner. It's something that he himself um, experiences, and then the only way anyone would have known about it is if he had told them, this is what happened to me. And it validated him. He was now son of God, and he was also given the power of prophecy. The Holy Spirit is the prophetic spirit. So he has the authority now to preach his own mission. According to the Gospels, it was only after John the Baptist's arrest that Jesus began his own ministry. He started wandering the villages and towns of Galilee, gathering around him a group of followers, his disciples. He also began performing a series of miraculous acts that form one of the most contentious aspects of his life, and preaching a dangerous message that would soon bring him into direct conflict with the ruling powers. In the next part, we will see how the gospel story of Jesus took him from the hills of Galilee to the Jewish capital, Jerusalem, where his life would reach its climax. What we really have with the stories of Jesus is that in his own time and place, he did have a reputation as a miracle worker. I'd call Jesus a revolutionary. He did what revolutionaries do. He challenged the structures of power. There's nothing that's happening by accident. He, he does seem to have a plan. He is what Dorothy Sayers calls the man born to die. <laughs>